You hear that little baby, guys? That's a sound of progress. Amen. Thanks to Cody and Goni, our church is growing. <laughs> Bless you. We want to celebrate life here at this church. And uh, I know it's the dark clouds are falling on our nation. People don't all see it that way. They don't see babies as a blessing anymore. And uh, nationally, we're going to have a day of mourning on the 23rd of this month, which is a Saturday. And for our part, our church, we want to meet here Saturday at 2 o'clock and gather at this altar and just seek God's forgiveness, to, to pray for the people who could think that, that murdering a child on any, you know, from conception to almost birth and even beyond, it's just barbaric and it's just so bizarre to me. But there are people who just believe that and who have got that to the halls of Congress and to the courts. And, it's, and, and, and that's, one, that's one portion of it, the people who just don't care if it's evil. They just want the convenience of retroactive birth control, whatever you want to call it. And that's, that's terrible. And then there's an industry that benefits from it, that, that takes the body parts and makes money off of that. That's barbaric and terrible. But beyond that, we have... 13, 14, 15 year old girls who are scared out of their minds because they're all of a sudden finding themselves pregnant and they don't know what to do. And all society's telling them, I'll pay the three, four hundred bucks and go get rid of it. It's just a blob of tissue. And they're being fed that. And then after they, they go through with it, then the guilt and the shame that they live with. You know, nobody wants to talk about that. They want to talk about their rights and everybody's rights, but what about those damaged boys and girls? about the young man who's paid for an abortion for his girlfriend? Living with that guilt. And what happens when they come to church? What do we lay on them? Oh, you murderer. Oh, you shame. You know what? We've got to find both sides of this issue. And we need God's help and His strength. So I invite all of you and your family and your friends and whoever you want. We're going to be here on Saturday, the 23rd. And we're going to get at this altar and we're going to seek God on this. Our nation needs it. Our families need it. Our community needs it. And our government really needs to wake up on this issue. Because the people, you know, we're, we're going to speak. We're going to let our voices be known. Not to bring guilt and shame, but to put an end to this barbaric thing and stop filling young people's heads with these kind of lies. So let, will you guys pray about that and think about that? Joining us here on the 23rd, it's a Saturday. Not this Saturday, the one after. Right here in this church at 2 o'clock. You think about that. All right? So, we celebrate life here. John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. I'm going to start reading in verse 15. John, chapter 14. I'm going to start reading in verse 15. Jesus says this. If you love me, obey my commandments. That'd be a good message just to stop right there, wouldn't it? You wish. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, or another advocate, whatever your translation is, another help me, power, who will never leave you, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive Him because it isn't looking for Him and doesn't recognize Him. But you know Him because He lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Okay? Do you guys see that? Last week we were talking about the Holy Spirit. You guys remember that? The Holy Spirit mentioned that He's the third person of the Trinity. Do you remember that, Keith? When we talked about that, you, <laughs> you were uh, busy being with your grandchildren or your grandchild, so you're you're excused. Well, we as born again, biblical-based Christians believe that our God is three persons. 
Not three separate gods. It's not polytheism. It's not something crazy like that. Our God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all through the ministry of Jesus, we see it played out. We see it demonstrated. Jesus was always talking about his Father. From the time he began his ministry, the baptism, where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all present, all through his ministry, he was giving glory to his Father. He was seeking his Father. And he was doing everything he did by the Spirit. And now he's talking about going away, and he's talked to his Father about sending that Spirit to us. You might as well say us. And that Spirit is what makes us different. You know, I don't know about you, but as hard as I tried, I just couldn't be <coughs> good. I ended up telling a little white lie, which turned into a gray lie. <laughs> and after that, it turned into a, just a darn black lie. <laughs> but I couldn't, I couldn't stay honest. I couldn't be faithful. I couldn't do right. I was always up to something, and it just never turned out right. I couldn't do it on my own. And if you read in the Old Testament, those guys didn't do so much good either. They tried. A couple of them did. But most of the time, even the best ones were falling into sin somehow. We needed something better in our life. Now, when we read in the Old Testament, of course, the Spirit of God coming on people at different times, like uh, if you read about Samson in the book of Judges, when the Spirit of God came on him, he was strong, and he could rip off a city gate, and he could do all kinds of things. He could take a jawbone of a donkey and uh, you know, take on a whole army. He could do exploits when the Spirit of God came on him. When the Spirit of God came on David, he could write songs and sing songs that would break your heart, make you cry, and make you worship God all at the same time. It's the Spirit of God that was doing that. And all through, the, the prophets, the Spirit of God would come upon them and they would speak forth things concerning the future, things concerning their present and past and all that by the Spirit of God. But Jesus is saying, something different is going to happen now. That Spirit of God that's been on you, when I go to the Father... I pray to him, and he's going to send you the advocate, the comforter, the helper. And he's going to be in you. Guys, that is the difference. I, I couldn't do good before, like I said. But now with the Spirit inside me, helping me, transforming me, renewing me, picking me up when I fall down, straighten me out from time to time, Leading me and guiding me, telling me things about the future, telling me things to avoid. You know, I, I did mention convicting me of my sins. That is what the Spirit's job is. And He seals us, and He lives in us, and He abides in us, and He speaks to us. And every time He hears the Bible preached, He goes, yes, that's good. I mean, what, what we need to do as Christians... We need to learn how to listen to that Spirit of God that's inside of us. He wants to speak to us. He wants to guide us. But so many Christians have dulled that relationship with the Holy Spirit. He's still there, I think. You know, but he, he just doesn't talk to you because I mentioned last week he's a gentleman. You know, he'll stand there politely and wait for his turn to talk. He won't just over-speak and barge his way into your life and take over and kick the door open. You know, last week I gave you the scenario about the boyfriend who shows up at your front door to date your daughter. Right? If a guy knocks on your door real loud, and before you can get to the door, he barges in, puts his feet up on your table, raids your refrigerator, makes himself a sandwich, changes the channel on your TV... That guy's a brute. Don't let that guy date your daughter. But the guy who stands there, preferably with flowers, right, politely waits for you to open the door, waits to be invited in, doesn't sit in any place unless he's told, oh, you please sit over here. He's a gentleman. You look at your wife and you say, we want her to marry this guy. This is the one. Let's keep him. Right? Well, the Holy Spirit is that gentleman. He comes, he knocks at the door, he awaits to be invited. He, he waits for his opportunity. He will speak to you. He will clarify things to you. 
You need to learn how to develop that relationship in your heart. And I don't hear a lot of preachers talking about that. You know, they want to talk about what you should and shouldn't do. But I'll tell you what, I don't know about you, but I need some help. I'm not doing so great all the time. I need a helper. Well, that Holy Spirit is just that. There's a Greek word. How many Greek scholars do we have here today? None? <laughs> that's odd. Well, that's actually pretty normal. I'm not even one. There's a Greek word that we translate the word advocate, helper, uh, whatnot. It's a Greek word called paraclete. Anybody ever, ever heard that before? Ever heard that preached before? Good, thank you. Paraclete literally means one called alongside to help. Has anybody ever heard of a paralegal? That person, thank you, one more person. I'm glad you came. <laughs> a paralegal is not a lawyer, but that person goes around with the lawyer and helps them, does the research, does the filing, does the phone calls, the mailing, and, and gets everything, gets the, the precedence of, of different trial dates and things like that. And she helps the lawyer out. She's beside him and she helps, or he. Usually it's a girl, though. Uh, but a, a paralegal. Ever heard of a parachute? Well, if you ever intend to go skydiving, you better read up on that one. <laughs> I don't know if that's the same thing or not, but I just thought I'd throw it in there. For a parasite. <laughs> you got one limit at your house? Never mind. I'll, I'll move on. But uh, advocate. That the Holy Spirit is called your advocate. And that may not be a word you commonly know, but if you've ever been in any kind of legal trouble, you find yourself an advocate, which is another name for a lawyer. Right? I recommend Greg Fox over town. Great guy. Oh, what a blessing he has been in my life. In many ways. He's, he's helped this church. He's helped my mom and her estate and her family. I highly recommend him. A good, honest lawyer. He's not, you know, an, an ambulance chaser. He's not a, a, a shark or, you know, all, all the negative things they call lawyers. I highly recommend that guy. But uh, a, a good lawyer goes to bat with you. A good lawyer sits beside you when you're before the judge. The good lawyer says, now's not a good time to talk. A good lawyer says, maybe you shouldn't answer that question right now. A good lawyer says, well, maybe we need to look into this further before we act. But he gives you the confidence because he's always there beside you, always advising you. And he's there to help you win your case. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you realize this, but the Holy Spirit is in your life to help you win. Did you know that? That He's for you? I mean, He's not for you to make a mess of yourself. He'll you know, call things to your attention and you need to straighten up, of course. And He'll advise you not to go here, or not to do this, or not to speak, or not to say, yeah, well, you listen to Him. There's the rub, isn't it? But He's a, he's a good lawyer. The next thing He's called is the Helper. I will send you a helper, Jesus said. When the Holy Spirit, capital H and capital S, Holy Spirit, not goofed up spirit, not crazy spirit, not, you know, like school spirit or anything like that, or team spirit. We're talking the Holy Spirit. He's absolutely amazing. He's absolutely powerful. He's absolutely perfect and wonderful in every way. Do you want that guy on your team? Question. Do you want that guy on your team? Yes. You're allowed to move your head up and down. That's good. The guys on the camera, you can't see this, but sometimes they're afraid of me. They're afraid I'm going to trick them into nodding their head. That wasn't a trick. That was a real good thing. You need help, guys. I'm not just saying that. You do. You need a lot of help. Some of you really need help. And then there's people like me who really, really, really need help. Well, someone who loves you and cares about you and wants you to win... He's on your team. He wants to help you. Is that good? Yes. yes. Thank you. That's very good. What a blessing. So you're struggling in an area of your life? You, some things in, in life you just don't understand? Some things just like tear you up and just, you know, 
throw you, knock you down, and you don't know what to do. You don't know where, what ends up, and you don't know what's going on. Don't you want somebody on your team who's going to help you up, who's going to give you some instructions, who's in your corner, who's going to rub you down and say, look out for the left, look out for the right. When he jabs, you go this way. You need a helper. You do. And that's what he does for you. And he doesn't just tolerate you and roll his eyes and say, oh gosh, Ty Carlin, man, do I got to help that guy again? Is he at it again? Do I have to get involved in it? He's not that way at all. He's like, I'm for you, buddy. I love you, man. I'm, I'm on your team. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to make this better. Trust me. Learn to listen to me. Learn to follow me. And we are going to get this done. In Jesus' name. That's how he rolls. He's a good thing to have in your life. I bet nobody's really ever talked to you about that, huh? The Holy Spirit's always this pie in the sky thing, or the Holy Spirit's always this crazy thing that makes you cluck like a chicken or bark like a dog in the, in, in the uh, church service. It's time to call the dog catcher on some of those churches, I don't have to say. But, you know, the Holy Spirit isn't weird, okay? People are weird. Crazy, stupid people who think they're hearing from the Holy Spirit, they need some help. But the Holy Spirit is such a gentleman. And he's so powerful. And he's so good. And he loves you and he wants to help you. Am I belabored that enough? <laughs> Two people that love their head. The rest of you, I need to belabor it more to you. So he's your helper. You know what else he is? He's your teacher. He's always in your heart saying, yes, that's good. Follow that. Yes, that's excellent. Listen to that. Yes, let's let's go to that church and let's listen to that guy. Or no, that guy's crazy. Let's not listen to it. Let's go. Over. Yes, let's read that portion of scripture. Yeah, he's always teaching you, always instructing you. Uh, ignorance. Have you ever heard that word, ignorance? I I like that word. I know that's a strange thing for me to say, but ignorance is I don't know. And I've spent a lot of my life in ignorance. <laughs> There's a lot of things I don't know. Right? There's no shame in ignorance. There is a cure for it, I hear. Good information. It cures ignorance every single time. I absolutely love, like, when, when young people come to me and have a question about the Bible. I'll do my best to give the best answer I can, and I'll trust the Holy Spirit to fill in the blanks that I don't have, and, and, and let Him teach you, and let Him guide you, and use teachers like me or somebody else to help you along. That's great. That's what God wants to do. For some reason, He chooses people you know, to teach, but He helps as well. So your teacher will, will help you get over your ignorance. Isn't that a good thing? I'm, I'm, here's, a, here's a trick question. So watch out, it's about to be tricky. How many of you want to be ignorant? Good, now that's the kind of question you don't raise your hand for. You're learning. How many of you want to stop being ignorant? I'll put both my hands in. Just as an aside here, ignorance there's a cure for. Stupidity, that's another ballpark, man. That's, that, I don't know if there's a cure for that. Some people just seems like... They have no cure for their stupidity. And I always like to say, uh, ignorance is I don't know. Stupidity is, yeah, I know, but I don't care. What do you do with a person like that? Yeah, I've heard it said in the Bible, but I'd rather do it my way. Well, let me tell you something. That's stupid. Right? They're like, uh, God's good for you, but I don't need no God. Well, that's stupid. The fool has said in his heart that there's no God. That the scriptures aren't real, that the spirits not. That is a first class fool. And fool is just a fancy word for stupid. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do with stupid? I, once or twice, he's going to remind you, hey, Tom, you're being stupid. But if I continue in my stupidity, that gentleman is just going to say, okay, zip, not talking to you. I still love you, Tom. I, I care a whole bunch for you. But you're just going to have to run your stupid course till you probably end up on your face in the mud. And when you call out to me, I'll be here. I'll be waiting. And, and uh, I'll suggest again the thing I suggested before. And maybe this time you'll say, oh, Lord, that was good advice. Oh, Holy Spirit, thank you for bringing that to my attention. 
And he could go, I told you 12 months ago. But now nah, he loves you. He'll pick you up and wash you up and give you another chance. So the cure for stupid is a little bit rougher of a road. And I know because I've walked that road a few times. But some people just love that road of stupid. They just don't want to know. And that's the most baffling thing in the world for me. You know, if you would rather be drunk, if you would rather be a drug addict, if you'd rather be addicted to pornography or gambling or adultery or whatever your thing is, if you'd rather do that, I'm sorry for you, man, but there's only so much I can say and do. And there's only so much the Holy Spirit's going to say and do for you. If you want to be stupid, the Bible says, uh, sorry, but go ahead. And there comes a point where, where the Holy Spirit just goes, I don't know where the edge of that is. I don't know where that cliff is, where you've gone too far. God is going to have to be the judge of that. I'm not going to say that person's sinned too much. That person's just way too stupid to be saved. I, that is not my call. But the, but the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God doesn't always strive with man. There comes a point where you're saying, okay, it's your way. You did it to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart was so hard and so messed up. Okay, Pharaoh, you want to be that way? And Judas was so corrupt and so evil. Okay, Judas. You know, Peter denied the Lord. Peter betrayed the Lord. Peter lied. But he fell down and he repented and said, Oh, what a bonehead I've been. Please forgive me. That's scenario one. The other one. Oh, I betrayed innocent blood. I'm just not worth living. My life's a waste of time. Blah, blah, blah. That's the way Satan works with you, you know. He plays both sides against the middle. He's not your friend. You see, Satan doesn't love his children. Did you ever notice that? God loves his children, even when they're stupid. <laughs> he still loves them. They're hard to talk to. They're hard to straighten out. And they may turn it around, and they may come back home, but he still loves them. That's my God. And I'm so thankful they love stupid people and, and, and ignorant people. But the devil does not love his children. Does it? Here's what he does. Go do this. Go do that. Go do that. And so you follow him and you do this. And then he turns the tables like, oh, you worthless piece of crap. Oh, why'd you do that? Nobody will ever love you now. Nobody will ever forgive you now. You might as well just end it all. You might as well just jump off that bridge or hang yourself over there or take too many drugs over there. That's Satan. That's never God. That is never, ever, ever God. And it's never God's will to destroy a life like that or to destroy innocence like that. Never. My God doesn't do that. Satan does it every day. He gets you. He deceives you. Makes you do something. Then he turns the tables, tells you how awful you are. And if you kill yourself, he's happy. That's Satan. He, he does not treat his children well. But unfortunately, Satan's got a lot of kids. Do you agree? Enough of him. Let's go back to the Holy Spirit. Like I said, he's my advocate. He's my lawyer. He's my helper. He helps me out a lot. He's my teacher. He straightens me out. He teaches me. He shows me. He illuminates. And when I make a mistake, he dusts me off and he gets me back on track. He's my teacher. He's also my strengthener. The Holy Spirit gives me strength. You ever been in the middle of something and you say, I just can't do it? Happens to me every Sunday. <laughs> I go downstairs before I come up here, before any of you see me. I get here first. None of you are here. And I get on my knees every Sunday and say, I can't do this. No way. I'm not smart enough. I'm not clever enough. I'm not entertaining enough. I'm not educated enough. I cannot do this job. Lord, if you don't show up, if you don't help me, if you don't strengthen me, I'm just going to go home. Because, you know, these, I don't want to let these people down. They work all week, and they go through stuff. They come here and hear the Word of God. I'm, I'm a terrible person to be up here telling the Word of God. But if you, if you do something in me, if you fill me, if you strengthen me, if you lead me and guide me by your Spirit, I'll do the best I can. And maybe, just maybe, the Spirit will bless you through these humble messages of mine. That's my prayer every single Sunday, without fail. I guarantee it will be the one I have. The first prayer on my mouth next Sunday morning, too. Here I am again, Lord, and I can't do it. <laughs> the, the Sunday that I show up here saying, I got this. I'm good. I'm going to 
blow their socks off. I'm going to preach their, their heads off. I'm going to, you know, the day that I do that, please do me a favor and do yourself a favor. Fire me. Just give me my pink slip right there and then. Oh, self-sufficient one, hit the road. We need somebody humble up here. Well, I've been humbled many, many, many times, many, many, many Sundays. He is my strengthener. <coughs> Anybody here recently go through a terrible, terrible time? Something so emotional. It was draining. And what's even worse, when, when, when something's physically wrong with you, when you've got an ailment that just like hurts, when you're in pain, or where you're just like, you can't use both arms, or you can't, your, your feet ain't working, you need a walker, or a cane, or a chair, or it's just like, you're, you're not yourself, you're not ever saying, and that, that weighs a soul down big time. You know, and, and emotional things like a, a, a relationship that's broken, or the loss of a loved one, or some tragedy that befalls you. Hello, this is life. This happens to everyone. Everybody will go through some form of tragedy or some sort of letdown and, and God forbid, some sort of physical malady. We all go through stuff. We all go through dark, confusing times. We need a helper in those times, don't we? Thank God for the Holy Spirit during those times in my life. When I was just so depressed or so hurt or so in pain or whatnot and the Spirit came alongside me and says, one step at a time, Tom. One day at a time. Or one minute at a time. I'm with you. He usually leads me to the scriptures. And you know what's so funny? There's usually a scripture or two or ten that, that, that talks exactly about what I'm going through. You, know, you ever had anguish? So much anguish that you just couldn't even lift your head up. Did you know that your Lord and Savior in the garden, prayed so loud and so long, and he asked God, please, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Can you imagine? God in the flesh, second person of the Trinity, saying, take this away, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Have you ever felt that? I know I have. Many times. But the next thing that he says but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Do you see what he did? Do you see what he's teaching us? I'm not about my own comfort here. I'm about the greater good. In Jesus' case, it was saving all of mankind. Being the savior of the world. What's at stake for you? Sometimes it's just your sanity. <laughs> That's a good thing. Because he loves you. He wants you to be sane. He doesn't want you to be sad. He doesn't want you to be incapacitated. That's not God. That's the devil who wants you incapacitated, who wants you dead, who wants you crippled, who wants you maimed and ineffective, on the bench, not playing. That's the devil's will for your life. And too many give in to the devil's will. My advice? Find that voice of the Holy Spirit in the midst of your pain. Dig deep. When things get rough, don't run away from God. Run to Him. When you're confused and you don't know what's going on, don't run away from God. Run to Him. When the Bible isn't making sense, dig deeper. Ask questions. Pray. Find out. If you're ignorant, He will fix that. He will. I promise you. I'm living proof of it. <laughs> He's still fixing me. But you have the ability, you have the access to the infinite strength of the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, I know you're going to find it hard to believe, dwells in you. And He will quicken or make alive your mortal body. I know that's ultimately talking about the resurrection. But in the meantime, He's still in you. In the meantime, he can still quicken you. He can raise you up. He can lift you up. No matter what, he can do it. He wants to do it. I'm going to say that again. He wants to do it. This is going to blow some of your mind. God is not your enemy. 
God is not your persecutor. God does not want you to fail. Now, of course, he doesn't want you to make wrong decisions. They're ultimately going to destroy you. He may change your directions here and there. But he is for you. He is not against you. And with him alongside of you, the Holy Spirit I'm talking about, he will cause you to be strong. He will cause you to be well. And if God forbid your body that never does come into line, he is still in your heart. And he is still in your mind. And he is with you the whole time. Never leaves you. Jesus said right here, he will never leave you. Do you believe that he is for you? Do you believe that he is working for you? Really, ask yourself that. I can't say honestly, Tom, I've been living like, like God hates me. I've been conducting my life like God's a million miles away from me. I've been making decisions and walking around feeling low down and feeling like even God won't listen to me now. Or even God doesn't love me now. Am I getting a witness there? I've felt that way once or twice in my life. That's wrong. That's not true. That's not biblical. He does love you. He is for you. He's not against you. And he will strengthen you. He will. He's doing it right now. You may not realize it, but he is. Every time you hear the word of God, your faith's going to build. Every time you hear it again, it's going to build more. And you're going to hear it, and you're going to build more. I mean, you still got to make decisions. Is this true? Am I going to live like this? Am I going to follow like this? Am I going to listen to the voice of the Spirit? That's up to you. You want to stay ignorant? You want to stay stupid? It's up to you. But he's there. He's available. And he is strengthening you. Comforter. The Holy Spirit, my friends, is a comforter. Guys, sometimes there's just no words. Uh... My good friend, uh, you guys, many of you know him, Mo Lorda. Anybody know him? Mo Lorda? Tragically, his daughter was killed several years ago. Oh, it's been a while now, hasn't it? And when you, when you bury one of your own children, there are, I, I've never personally experienced it, but what, what is more tragic? What is, what is more heart-wrenching? What is more devastating than burying one of your own children? I couldn't imagine how bad poor Mo felt. And I remember going to his funeral, her funeral, and Mo standing by the casket of his daughter. My gosh, how terrible. And I remember coming up to him and saying, Mo, I have no words. I don't know what to say. And he threw his arms around me and he said, you don't have to say anything. You're here. And, and I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm a poor example of the Holy Spirit, but that's what the Holy Spirit does. Sometimes in the midst of your tragedy, in the midst of your terrible pain, he's just there sitting with you. Maybe he's not speaking to you, but in, in a way, he's, he's got his arms around you. He's there, comforting you. Do you believe that? I've experienced that in my life. The comfort of God. Like when I didn't know which end was up, and I, nothing was making sense, and I just, I honestly, sometimes you don't physically feel it, but sometimes there's, there's, there's just this warm blanket from from nowhere that just comforts you and says, I'm here. I'm, I'm just here. That is amazing. That is you. Whenever you're low, whenever you've got the blues, whenever you, you, you physically, emotionally, mentally, whatever, he's always there. And he is comforting you. He is. I can say that with all authority. So that's, we've got advocate, we've got helper, we've got teacher, we've got strengthener, we've got comforter. And my last one, leader. We have a lack of leadership on planet Earth. Would you all agree? 
How many people would you follow to the gates of hell? How many people would you follow on this cause or that cause? Most of us, especially we Americans, we are skeptical, to say the least. Oh yeah? Well, you go on ahead, Mr. Leader. I'll, I'll stay back here and watch you crash and burn. You know, that's, that's kind of where we are. I mean, political affiliations. Oh, my goodness. Anybody who's running for office, I, I, I pity them. I'm like, oh, my gosh, why do they want to do that to themselves? Aaron Bernstein came to my door one time, a long time ago, when he just started getting into the, uh, the political realm. And he knocked on my door, and he's asking for votes, and he wanted to know if there's anything in the community that I want to talk about, you know, which I thought was pretty cool. He seemed like a nice young man. And a lot of the things he said sounded good to me. And I says, can I ask you a question? And he says, sure, anything. I said, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to throw your hat in the ring? Why do you want to, like, go in this pool of sharks? What, what, what is motivating you? And he kind of impressed me. He, went, he just didn't have a pat answer. He didn't have this. He like just thought for a second. He says, you know what? Sometimes I just, I just want to do the right thing. Wow. What a great answer. Now I don't know how you feel about Aaron Bernstein, but I like the guy. Not perfect. Who is? You know, I voted for him. There you are. It's on YouTube. I voted for him. That's the last political thing I'm going to say today. But uh, you know what? Some, somebody sees something right that needs done, and they just get off, off their rear ends, and they do something. Whew. I'm more likely to follow a guy like that. Some people know something's right, but they won't lift a finger. They won't say a prayer. They won't send a dollar. They won't do nothing. Even though they believe with all their heart something's right or wrong, right? But a leader says, I just can't sit here anymore. i got to do something. And, uh, you know, the stories about the heroics on the battlefield. You know, there's, there's, I heard a lot of stories about Vietnam. You know, I had two brothers that were in Vietnam. And what happened a lot in Vietnam, uh, there was a, a, a major or a captain or a, a lieutenant on the phone with somebody. And there, there's uh, like 10 or 20 guys standing around with M16s. And the guy on the phone would say, okay, you guys go over there and, and, and shoot the heck out of what's ever up there and come back, and then we'll go up and count the bodies later. No, I'm sorry, I'm generalizing here. So they would look, and then a sergeant would raise up the gun and say, okay, guys, follow me. And that would give courage to those men. Here's a guy who, who's going to be in the lead, who we're going to follow. Now, he knows he might not come back. But he's going to go first. He's going to take the first bullet. He's going to risk the landmines. He's going to do it. That guy was scared. I mean, I'm not going to lie. He was scared. He was terrified. But he knew he wasn't going to ask these guys on the battlefield to do something that he wasn't prepared to do himself. That's a leader. That's the kind of people I'm talking about. Maybe that's some of you. I hope so. I'll take the first bullet. I'll take the first hit. But I just can't sit here and watch you guys go over that hill. I'm going first. That's who I'm talking about. And can I tell you something, guys? That's the Holy Spirit. He sees you sitting on your duff. And he sees that hill you've got to climb. And he's standing there in front of you and saying, Get up, Tom. We're going up that hill. Follow me. I'll go first. I'll take the first bullet. I'll take the first hit. In a sense, Jesus took the first hit for you. Do you know that? All the, all the ridicule you get for being a Christian, all the persecution you'll ever get, he took it first, and he took it hardest. And he endured it. And he won the victory. Now he says, come on, I guarantee you, Tom, you get up, we get to the other side of that hill, we're going to win. I already read the end of the book. We win, buddy. Get up! Let's go! That's the kind of person I want to follow. How about you? The kind of person who can inspire you. The kind of person who's not going to sit back and say, well, you go ahead and let me know how it turns out. That may be Washington, <laughs> but that's not the kind of leader I'm talking about. So your Holy Spirit loves you. He's rooting for you. He's teaching you. He's strengthening you. Strengthening you. 
He wants to lead you on to do greater things. Which means sometimes you got to get out of the boat. Which means sometimes you got to risk going out of your comfort zone. But he's there saying, come on, we can do this. I know you got the goods. I know you may not believe in yourself right now, but you trust. You, you build your faith. You keep reading the word. You keep saying your prayers. And you follow me. And you listen to me. And we're going to get there. And we're going to get through this. That's the Holy Spirit in your life. So uh, before I pick up that guitar over there every Sunday, I, I promise you this too. I tune my guitar. Because I wouldn't be doing you or anybody any favors playing an out-tuned guitar. And Keith up here would look over me and say, are we playing the same song? <laughs> and then Chris would be like, I can't sing this. If you're going to be out of tune, I can't sing it in tune. You know, so I have to do my part to get in tune. Here's your part. You've got to get in tune with the Holy Spirit, what we're talking about. He's already there, if you're a Christian. He loves you. That's, we've established that. He can strengthen you, he can teach you, and he can lead you in all the great things I said, but you've got to get yourself in tune. You've got to learn to hear his voice and to listen to his voice and not listen to the goofy voices out there. A lot of voices in my head. <laughs> you know, I, I don't often, times when I'm working, I don't turn the radio on. Someone says, why aren't you listening to the radio? I said, oh, i got enough voices in my head. I'm good. <laughs> but the, the one you've got to filter in is the Holy Spirit. What is he saying? What is he reading to you? And a good rule of thumb is, he's never going to go against the Word of God. He's never going to destroy an individual to get you ahead. He doesn't do that. He will lead you into all truth. He will guide you. He will remind you of what Jesus has said. And he will show you things to come. But a lot of you women, bless your hearts, you have intuition. You can say, oh, no, no, that's not such a good idea. You know, and that's a blessing. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can speak to women easier. I, I've noticed this. Because it's like women have an antenna that, 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 receive, that has better reception sometimes. It's a good idea, guys, to say, honey, what do you think? What's your read on this? You know? You know, if men, men just have the itty-bitty antenna, and we act on impulse, and we're ready to go, and, and we find out, oh, that was a mistake. But, and, and the wife is usually back there saying, I told you, you should have listened. I told you, you should have listened. Hey, viva la difference, is the first thing. So, the Holy Spirit is like your wife <laughs> sometimes. But uh, learn to listen. Learn to be in tune. Learn to hear His voice. And benefit from the great blessing that God has given you in the Holy Spirit. Does this clear up some things for any of you today? That is my hope and my prayer. I don't want to have to go and say, see God, I told you I couldn't do it. I told you I was a screw up. I told you I couldn't preach. You know, I'd like to say, wow, God, you came through. You really helped me out today. And a few people got it. And maybe it changed a few lives. That is all I could ever ask for. So bow your heads right now and let's pray. Father, we, we lift up your word because your word is truth. And Lord, we ask you to please lead us and guide us and teach us into all truth. And if there's some things in our lives we need to get rid of, if, there, if there's some things in our lives we need to avoid, please speak to us. And we repent, Lord, we're sorry for not listening to you better. We want to learn how to, to hear your voice better. We want to learn how to get in tune with you. So any obstacle, anything that's clogging the drain here, help us, Lord, to get that out, get that rotor rooted out of our souls, and, and help us clearly follow your leading in all things. So Lord, I ask you to bless these people, bless their families, bless the places they work, bless the places they go, and may everything they touch by your Holy Spirit be blessed. Give us a great day, and uh, bring us back to your house very soon, and bless that food next door to our bodies, and thank you for it, and bless the little hands that prepared and served it to you in Jesus' name. Everybody say, Amen. Amen. Hope you can join us next door for something to eat. I know I'm hungry. God bless. Amen.